sorry for the delay. Um, I'm Linda Essig, I'm the head of the PAVE program in arts entrepreneurship and I'm also your host and your erstwhile MC for this two-day event. And I want to tell you a little bit about, um, if we could leave the house lights on, that would be great. The house lights should just stay up the whole time. Thank you. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the PAVE program, what you can expect this weekend, and then I'll introduce you to our first speaker, Roberto Bedoya. It's his and, phone. And <laughs> <laughs> time to remind you to silence your cell phones. Uh, yes, okay, I do mind. So I want to tell you a little bit about the background of the PAVE program. When I came to ASU nine years ago, it was to head what was then the Department of Theater, and I saw this as a place of tremendous academic opportunity, made possible by both an administration and a faculty, and actually a student body of great entrepreneurial spirit. Two years later, I was the director of what was the School of Theater and Film, and my colleagues and I were able to seize on an opportunity to gather our entrepreneurial efforts together as part of a university-wide initiative uh, in entrepreneurship education. And so with the help of very generous support from the Kauffman Foundation, the PAVE program was born as an umbrella for a variety of activities, which today include curriculum, uh, and many of my undergraduate students are here today taking part in that curriculum, um, undergraduate coursework, and starting next year, an MFA concentration in arts, entrepreneurship, and management. So if you're looking for a new graduate program, you can see me at one of the breaks. Um, we do uh, research, and in fact, we publish the only scholarly journal with a, a focus on arts entrepreneurship, uh, an arts venture incubator for student uh, ventures, for student-initiated projects, and a few of those are you'll be hearing about tomorrow morning, and public programming, which includes this biennial symposium. Um, if you look in your folders, and if you want to follow along with me, you can do that, um, or not, up to you. Um, you'll see that there's a program schedule. You might want to review that. Bios of all of our presenters uh, right behind there. There's a description of the projects that are featured in our student pitch showcase. And there's a postcard about the feast on the street. And the feast on the street is a creative placemaking event sponsored by our, by our ASU Art Museum and the very entrepreneurial folks at the Roosevelt Row Community Development Corporation. Um, I also, just so you, again so you know what to expect, I go to a lot of academic conferences. I, I don't know how you feel about this. I'm not a big fan of three people sitting behind a table reading their research papers, so you are not going to get that uh, here. You're going to have uh, two days of workshops and, and talks and Q&A and give and take uh, with each other and with our guests. So it's, it's really not a conference and uh, it's a symposium. Uh, there'll be times when you'll be asked to get on your feet and participate and maybe make stuff and mark our own uh, creative places. Before I introduce our first speaker, I wanna thank our home unit, the School of Theater and Film, and our partners, the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts, the ASU Art Museum, Roosevelt Rose CDC, the Phoenix Hospital and Cultural Center, and the Arizona Commission on the Arts for their in-kind support. I want to thank very much the 20 or so student volunteers who are helping out this weekend uh, and let you know that it's okay to tweet. Uh, in fact, it's encouraged. Please use the hashtag PaveASU. You can see it very faintly in the bottom of the slide. Hashtag PaveASU if you're a tweeter. Um, and with that, uh, I'll, I'll start my introduction to Roberto Bedoya. The concept of entrepreneurship and the concept of creative placemaking are both double-edged swords. And in a recent article, Anne Godwin Nokodemus, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, so forgive me, discussed the slippery relationship between arts-based creative placemaking efforts and gentrification. In it, she references Roberto Bedoya of the Tucson Pima Arts Council. The creative placemaking projects in which he has been involved directly engage, it's okay, it's okay. come on in, please welcome, directly engage with the um, with the potential for inequity in such efforts. And he's done so in projects like the Finding Voice program, in which refugee youth generate stories and images through print publications and art projects at malls and bus stops. And the Worker Transit Authority, an exhibition by artist Bill Mackey of mock planning projects created by a mock planning authority, in which Tucson residents engaged in three weeks of dialogue on issues of land use, infrastructure, and transportation. And with that short introduction, which does not begin to do him justice, I'll turn it over to Roberto to talk about creative placemaking and the politics of belonging and disbelonging. 
Well, thank you. Um, hi, Michael. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to primarily uh, talk about this paper I wrote and then do some little spins uh, and share with you what's. Oh. Um, so I, there you go. So I was thinking about um, how to begin, um, and um, I'm going to begin with a poem, not by me, but by Ophelia Sepata, who's from Tolono Autumn Nation, um, Tucson poet, winner of a MacArthur Award for poetry. So, the poem is called Words on Your Tongue. You come here on silver wings. You gather on a fruit ripening month. You come from the river people. You come from people of the foothills of the Sierra Madre. You come from people of the tall pine. You come from the people of the round earth place. From the four corners of the earth. You come with the glint of turquoise in your eyes and salt on your tongue. You come here and see a lost sandhill crane sitting on top of a telephone pole in the desert. You watch him survey the land for moisture. Moisture still a long time in coming. You watch as his attention is momentarily distracted by empty washes and memory of wetness. You hear him cry the word for water. You come here on silver wings. You come here from the people of towering clans from people of desert lands. You come from river crosses. You come from people who are water bearers. You come from pollen resting on your shoulders and the smoke from cl cleansing blessings still lingering in your clothes. Your family blessed you before you traveled. You have prayers for your safety. You held out gifts for you, gifts of words, of stories. You come to us from people with words on their tongue. So welcome, you come to us, to this little gathering here. Um, and so I think it's important to say too that I come from the Eligio Bedoya, who was my father, was born in Silver Bell, Arizona, and Beatriz Gomez from Santa Cruz, California. So I got, that was 61 years ago, so now I'm here in front of you guys. Um, I'm gonna talk about place and, and sort of placemaking and the notions of belonging and disbelonging, which I've been really thinking a lot about. And the examples that were mentioned earlier is about projects that I support. Did I get my water? Thank you. So, um, a favorite song of mine is Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered by Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, that version of that song that is warm, radiant, where you feel each word in pure tones. Ella sings about love, a blind love, an escape from that bewitchment. That is a song that plays for me in the background when I think about the practices of creative placemaking, which as an arts manager and policy maker, I define as those cultural activities that shape the physical and social characteristic of a place. I embrace placemaking in its, all its aspirations as it is manifest in a variety of methods from city planning to art practices with the goal of advancing humanity. <clears throat> but I'm bothered by what I consider a significant blind spot, a blind love of sorts in the creative placemaking discourse and practices. I'm referring to a lack of awareness about the politics of belonging and disbelonging that operate in civil society. Alice sings, I'm wild again, beguiled again, a simpering, whimpering child again, 
bewitched, bothered, and bewildered am I. <clears throat> Wild can be fun. Beguiled, I don't know. The jury's still out on that one. The lyrics raise the questions for me about what I perceive and suspect in some instances is a blind love associated with creative placemaking practices. How do we understand and talk about creative placemaking? Is it the narrative of potentiality and its bewitchment that's bought, sold, and traded upon in, in management practices? Or is it engagement with spatial justice, the empowerment of talent, of community? These contextualizing concerns inform my work and the questions I'm asking here. In my work, I'm in dialogue, often in debate, with peers across the country about creative placemaking, prompted by two significant philanthropic initiatives, the National Endowment for the Arts, Our Town Program, and Our Place, a collaboration of numerous public and private foundations that are investing in creative placemaking projects nationally. <clears throat> what I've witnessed in these discussions and practices associated with creative placemaking is that they're tethered to a meeting of place manifest in the built environment. For example, artists live workspaces, cultural districts, spatial landscapes, and this meaning, which operates inside the policy frame of urban planning and economic development, is okay, but it's not the complete picture. Its insufficiency lies in lack of understanding that before you have places of belonging, you must feel you belong. Before there's a vibrant street, one needs to understand, needs an understanding of the social dynamics on the street politics of belonging and disbelonging at work and place making in civil society. Our society is under a great deal of stress, triggered by the continuing recession and its challenges to our economy, the growing plutocracy's abuse of our civil rights, the cultural 2.0 battles over women's right to control their own bodies, the right of union workers, the right of Mexican American students to study Latino literature, the rights to be free of racial profiling, the rights of gay and lesbian to marry their loved ones, immigrant rights. You can add your own example of the politics of disbelonging at work in civil society. The nation is far from perfect. A troubling tenor of creative placemaking discourse is an avoidance of addressing social and racial injustices at work in society and how they intersect with creative placemaking projects. <clears throat> Against this background, creative placemaking, creative placemaking practices must understand history critical race theory and politics alongside the spatial planning and economic de development theories that dominate the discourse. How race, class, poverty, and discrimination shape place through a politics of belonging or disbelonging needs to be reflected on whether one is engaged in creative, ma creative making practice as an artist, funder, developer, NGO, or government agency. <clears throat> one needs to reflect upon U.S history and his trouble, troubling legacy of placemaking. Manifested acts of displacement, removal, and containment. The history is long and horrible. For the forced movement of American Indians from their lands and to the confinements and their confinement to reservations, the Chinese Exclusionary Act of 1882, the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, to urban development movement of the 60s and 70s that destroyed working poor and ethnic neighborhoods across America using the language of life alongside bulldozers. How does creative place make it different or complicit with these actions? <clears throat> what are the imperatives that inform, infuse creative placemaking act activities? What are the visions of our humanity that are manifest in the plurality animated by placemaking activities? It's ethics. How do ethics inform policies that support distinctiveness and identity of a place? Placemaking in city, neighborhood spaces, it enacts identity and activities that allow personal memories, cultural histories, imaginations, and feelings to enliven <clears throat> the sense of belonging to human and spatial relationships. But a, policy, but a political understanding of who is and who is outside of central cultural vitality. How does that's right. A political understanding of who is in and who is out is also central to civic vitality. How do current place-making activities practice support this knowledge? 
The relationship of creative placemaking activities to civic identity must investigate who has or doesn't have civil rights. If creative placemaking activities support the politics of disbelonging through acts of justification, racism, real estate speculation, all in the name of neighborhood revitalization, then it betrays the democratic ideal of having an equitable and just civil society. Is the social imaginary at work in creative placemaking activities when enclaves of privilege are developed in which the benchmark of success is a whole food market? The task of us who work in placemaking activities is to ensure and sustain a mindful awareness of what is authentic in creative placemaking. The authenticity I invoke is grounded in an ethos of belonging, cultural and civic belonging, how to create it, how to understand and accommodate cultural differences in matters of civic participation how to enhance the community's understanding of citizens, citizenship beyond the confines of <clears throat> leisurely pursuits and consumption, how to help the citizens of a place achieve strength and prosperity through equity and civility, having a sense of belonging therefore, nears, <clears throat> having a sense of belonging therefore needs to be foregrounded in creative make, making practices. As a policymaker, I argue for the aesthetics of, be, of belonging as central to creative placemaking. The blind love a creative place meeting is that is tied to the lure uh, speculation culture and its economic thinking, build it and they will come, is suffocating and uneth unethical. <laughs> and it supports a politics of disbelonging employed to manufacture a place. Creative place making and its aesthetics of belonging contribute to and shape our person. The rights and duties of the individuals crucial to a healthy democracy that stim animate the commons. It also animates creative placemaking, not as a development strategy, but a series of actions that build spatial justice, healthy communities, and sites of imaginations. Hell's bewitchment, bewitch song ends with some words of witnessing. Wise at last, my eyes at last, are cutting you down to size at last, bewitched, bothered, and bewildered no more. No more is the assertion social and cultural act activists must use to dispense creative playmaking's allure and its bewitchment, bewitching blind love effect. Let us support the ethics and aesthetics of creative placemaking grounded in belonging and have the wisdom of Ella's witness to blind love gone wrong. Let us reflect upon the work of creative placemaking and ask if the activity is engaged in the politics of belonging or disbelonging. Has it sucked out creative life or supported? Is it ethical and just? And let our answers to these questions be centered to our self-reflection in discussions of impact, of outcome, of success, in the, and failure in the work being done. This, this particular piece was published in, a, in um, a blog called Arts in a Change in America, which I'll talk a little bit um, further. But at that point, after I did my little read, I figured I'd better tell a story. Uh, and so in some ways, somebody accused me of just being like, somebody said to me, oh, Roberto, you just like to problematize things. And I said, yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, I enjoy it. Um, but at the same time, I also just don't want to sit there and you know, break the windows at the church with my rocks. Um, so the Arts Council has initiated in 2008 an initiative called the Place Initiative, People, Land, Arts, Culture, and Engagement, which is sort of informs my thinking about this ethos of belonging and aesthetics of belonging. Uh, and to date, we've probably funded about 53 projects, and they range you know, from happy face, let's make a mural, to more contentious, um, let's look at death in the desert of migrants crossing the border. Um, and, and, and I love them all. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about three particular sort of projects that we supported. Um, Linda mentioned some of them. One that I really like um, is uh, <coughs> Folk Life Field School, uh, which was part of an initiative that Tucson Meet, Meet Yourself did. And basically, in Tucson, the Pasquayaki tribe has a little enclave right in the middle of town, basically, just 
10 minutes from downtown. And um, working with indigenous communities, you know, they're so often a subject of research. And so there's this leeriness about, you know, the scholar coming to talk to them. Um, and so what we did in this particular project, we, we, we did what folk, folk like field school. So we went to this, the old, old Pasqua, the, the res there, and taught all the neighborhood folks how to be their own documentarian, how to be their, how to figure out how to tell their own stories and not be the subject of research and have agency. So that was uh, uh, a particularly wonderful project. It was involved acid mapping, uh, photography, documentation of cultural traditions. So, so to me, that's in a good example of placemaking that's about sort of finding a way to tell your story. Um, um, and a community asserting its agency. Um, we mentioned earlier Bill Mackey's work, work in Transit Authority. I love this project because it was one of those sort of highfalutin conceptual art school type projects. Um, but it was a wonderful uh, experience because basically people are asked to figure out how they move through the city. Uh, do they walk to work? Do they take a bike? How long do they drive? to work um, and then there's this whole so there was a, a bit of you know you know how postmodern modernity loves irony so we had this little thing where we're trying to look at like the official transit authority well, what happens if if you know you ask the actual the workers who are going to work every day talk about how they go to work and try to do a, a shift in their perceptions in which you actually think about the routes and your behavior and I loved it because it was whimsical, it was playful, it was very successful. It was in downtown and then one of the elected officials had it in his ward office and you know, it got a lot of buy-in. Uh, but that's an example of a place making in which you, you can actually kind of turn your, try to impact thinking about like how you uh, move through a city and movement um, as part of place making. Uh, Finding Voice was a project that works with refugee kids. It's been, we've been working with this project for many years, um, and they're wonderful. Um, and basically, it's sort of, most of the refugees in, in Tucson are, uh, believe it or not, come from Somalia and Bhutan. It's kind of a funny mix, but they get sent to Tucson. Um, and so, you know, the, the, acculturation process, which is kind of a funny word to say, but obviously, you know, they, they were really, what happens in that program every year, the kids decide what they want to do. And it's usually a, a, a kind of a tell a story with photography and words, and then present that story. But what's unusual about this project and this school and this particular <coughs> practice of creative placemaking is that the kids identify a product, a book usually, a photo exhibition, and, and a policy outcome. They say straight up, I want to change, the first year I met them, they were going to change immigration policy, they did their car wash, they went to Washington, D.C., they met with elected officials, they were going to change it. But they, so they think of their creative placemaking practices as placemakers that have a beautiful piece of art, but also have a policy outcome. Um, and most recently, they were really determined to make a green space on campus. On their, they go to a, a Pueblo High School. So they talked to the principal and they figured it all out and now they've got a, they've got, you know, a green space for them. Uh, they, then they, they told the story of their success in the mall with big posters. Um, so that, those are, those are sort of examples. And then one, some final thoughts before I just open uh, up to questions. Um, I have a habit of sort of writing stuff when I get all hot and bothered and I say some things and I go, I don't really know what I'm saying. If I were a, an art history student, I'd be out the door and you know, but okay, I can, I can, in this piece, there are a couple of things that I, I'm 
I've said, and they become sort of like my homework assignment. So I'm just going to give you a little tease of three sort of like concepts I'm playing with as they relate to placemaking. Obviously, the aesthetics of belonging um, and, and its ability to sh shape a community of aesthetics. So, okay, and placemaking in that context of creating a community of aesthetics, creating an articulation of beauty as a plural activity, uh, not just as it relates to objects, not, as, uh, not beauty as it relates to, so exclusively beauty as it relates to objects, beauty as it relates to experience, but, but uh, beauty as it relates to community. And, and I have to be really precise here, not community as a noun, but community as a verb. So in some ways, those are sort of like a clothesline that I'm gonna be hanging some stuff down off of it. Uh, one of the beauties of being in Southern Arizona um, is this, and with my community that I work with, is this notion of stewardship, which is really a strong feeling among uh, m the, my, grant, my, the, my artist community. I can't, well, I feel uncomfortable saying that they're mine, they're not mine. You know, I work for them. But anyway, um, <clears throat> cultural stewardship as a concept has been something that I've been thinking of an awful lot about. And what, it, you know, it, which concerns itself with tending the work of imagination, the realm, of the realm that embodies both the aesthetic and ethical experiences of being in relation to art, to community, to one another, and how to make the principles of cultural stewardship operational and management practices with, and for me, and this kind of relates to creative placemaking practices, is to understand what it means to be a deliberative practitioner based on the principles of deliberative democracy. Because if you're gonna do placemaking work, and if you're a placemaker, you gotta listen. You gotta listen, look, and learn all the time from who you're talking with. And those, and the, and, and, you know, the principles of a deliberative democracy can te teach you that skill set. And the last thing, and this is sort of, this is, this is, where I, I sometimes feel I can be like a, a weird poet paladin. Um, how many of you are old enough to remember the TV show Paladin? None of you, okay, there you go. Paladin was like, when I grew up a kid, was a TV Western, and it was about a, um, a cowboy who lived in San Francisco, he was a dandy, he always wore black all the time. He had a card and it said, have gun, well travel. And it was a little chess piece. But this idea of a paladin as sort of this, this warrior, this sort of person that comes out there. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I think, well, what, is it, what would a poet paladin do? How does he make his arguments? Uh, or her make, how does she make the arguments? And in some ways, I've been thinking about uh, as a byproduct of placemaking conversations that I've been engaged in more nationally than just in my local context is the idea of the sovereignty of context. And, and that for me, working in Arizona and along the border, I have a greater understanding how the Sonoran Desert and the indigenous worldviews shape this, shape this place and culture production. Um, and in that, so, you know, I, I just, like, for example, I was in a, on a phone conversation with somebody, a tele, uh, you know, just one of those conference calls. And somebody from Art Place was there, and they were talking about the vitality indicators. And they talk about walkability. And I kind of looked, and I said, man, first of all, that's kind of an odd one, because everything is walkable. I mean, you choose whether you want to walk or not and how conducive, are, how are you encouraged to walk. But walkability in the desert is something completely different than it would be in a, in, in, in a big city on the coast. So that's what I was showing. This is where I understand the context of being in the border and in the desert. It's not sometimes the knowledge that is informing policy, make, policy makers elsewhere. Um, so, um, and then when you work inside Indian country, um, you, you, you have this profound sense of what sovereignty means, sovereignty means. And it's, it's, 
it's weird because it's, it, it impacts governance systems and, and support systems, but it's, it's just kind of interesting. It's inside and outside of law at the same time. And in some ways, it's a weird thing about the sovereignty of context. Because if you're going to do placemaking work and as placemakers, you just have to constantly make sure that it's um, loosey-goosey. I mean, you don't, don't tie it all up. Make sure that, I mean, that's, that's not the right word. That, 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 the, that it's messy. That it's messy. Because it's, it's about vitality, and vitality comes out of mess. Um, at least that's my thinking. Um, also, um, and I have to be really blunt here, about you know, the sovereignty of context. Also, I understand the fact that most recently I've been asked to write about whiteness and, 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 and the white you know, racial frame and how it works in culture. Um, and you know, I, I think if you, if you embrace context, you understand that we live in a multiracial world and you know, the dominant ideology of whiteness is fading. Um, and yet it's still, it's still in all the systems. So um, it's, it's really weird. So then I think about when we talk about public spaces, are we talking about white public spaces? Are we talking, when we talk about creative place making, are we have, is there imaginary of a, of a place that is um, still in some way shaped by um, a notion of, that has been constructed around, that's aligned with whiteness? That's a, always a hard conversation to do because white folks get really nervous when you talk about whiteness. On that note, I'll answer any questions from you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Could you define what you mean by whiteness? Because I'm white and I don't relate to a lot of white people. So when I was thinking through my own values and stuff, I might not necessarily be comfortable. I didn't bring, my, I didn't bring that essay with me. Yeah, so it is, it's pretty much the dominant ideology that this nation was created, created around in the sense that this normality. Uh, and you could ask every white person probably, and they'll probably feel the same thing that you do. However, you know, it is constructed around a worldview that is in many ways shaped by, you know, this, this, this form of thinking. It's not, it's, 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 it's ultimately deeply embedded with notions of privilege. And? Well, thank you so much. I really love this piece. I think it's important. I do want to really invite you into the world of urban and regional planning, which we've been teaching at universities for years, which has tons of progressive content and lots of discussions. The planners network and the organization that we have that has been doing this work for 30 or 40 years in lots of ways. Opposing that is, you know, the sort of concrete building and place making and really working with communities and so on and so forth. So I'm proud of that tradition. It isn't everybody in urban planning, but it is one of the most progressive areas in universities in the U.S. I wanted to ask something, uh, you know, tr try to get you to, to come down and be more concrete and detailed about this because I, I, I have two things that I grapple with a lot. And one is there are communities in which different people who are all, you know, in need of equity are struggling over the same space. And what do you do in a situation like that? Suppose you have a city where, uh, you know, there's a Native American organization that's really on the rise and it's really claiming a certain area and quarter as it, it's and it's it's getting foundation money to do some really wonderful things for the Native community and the Native community's never really had, you know, that kind of thing. But there are also a lot of Somali people and African Americans and so on in the neighborhood and they're not as well organized, et cetera. So I think one of the I think it's when you're actually on the ground level, it's often not that simple. Are there conflicts between younger people and older people? Um, or even in a case I'll show briefly tonight, in Santa Ana, California, you have this robust cultural organization of recent immigrants from Veracruz called El Centro Cultural. They've been kicked out of six buildings, and they're fighting their all Latino city council that wants to bring in nice university student has already, you know, artist housing and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, how do you really, uh, when you have situations like that where you have and, and also there's just a lot of flux. I guess that's the other thing too. So people are, new people are coming all the time. And often the most recent immigrants are the people most in need 
but they may be, you know, moving into some, you know, place that was other recent immigrants. And so, how do you negotiate those kinds of, you know, conflicts? Um, let me. Um, let me before I answer that question. Let me just sort of talk a little bit um, about. Um, I think a lot of my thinking about. Um, well, maybe let me start here. I think an awful lot about deliberative democracy. That's really important to me. Uh, so when I'm in dialogue with neighborhood associations and different communities, I'm, I'm mindful of that. But I want to step back for a little bit. I came through, I came to sort of understand deliberative democracy through urban planning, through some urban planners that I read about in, in the Netherlands and how they were dealing with disputes about um, open spaces. So that, that sort of said, okay, well, wait a second, what's going on here? And that sort of thing. So I'm not to say that I understand that there's, you know, great thinking. Um, I think highly of Ed Soja and the notion of spatial justice. And that's, so those are, it's not, I didn't mean to damn completely uh, theory. Uh, but, but, well, you know, both, a little bit of both. But a city manager may not have read it, read that, you know what I mean? And um, I think the, the, you know, one of the, here's a funny, the big sigh is always, usually a story about public art. Right, Rex? Right, <laughs> Anybody that does manage the public art pro projects like in my city, it's inevitable that they're always a, a, a contention. Um, uh, it may be around an aesthetics, it may, it may be over whose story you're gonna tell. Um, uh, and it may not be over a space, per se, a building, but the idea of sort of figuring out what I said earlier about listening, learning, and looking uh, in order to feed your knowledge. Um, and then when I, if it gets really, really naughty and, un, and I can't resolve it through dialogue and deliberations, I sort of also throw down this. Uh, uh, and again, it's another political notion that comes from Chantal Mouffe about the notion of negotiated equivalences, uh, that you try to create a chain of equivalences. So I can say to Joe, I'm sorry you lost today, but Joe, you're gonna be working with Mary and maybe a year from now and you two may win and you two lost today. So the idea that you, you sort of think about equivalences longer and you teach how to live with, not animosities, but with antagonisms and not try to make it all happy face. Um, and you know, it's sort of like that's what you demand as a professional when you come to the table and say, this is how it works. You may win, you may lose. Uh, you may hate me, you may love me, I don't know. But we're trying to get the best we can out of this situation. So you know, when I say what, is, what are the ethical principles of placemaking, it really, I want my constituency to say, is this just, is this equitable? You know what I mean? And if it takes a really long time, it takes a really long time. The beauty of, of being in Tucson where there's no money, there's plenty of time. <laughs> Anybody else? The, and then you, Michael. Oh, good. Welcome. <laughs> um, and uh, highly influenced by Ray Oldenburg. In a great good place, and a guy named Dan Chemis, Missoula, Montana, who wrote Politics and the Poetry of Place. Um, and it's, it's strike, and my favorite place in the United States is Bryant Park, because I think Bryant Park does a couple of things. One is the chairs are all movable, and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, and everybody's welcome. There's no, there's no segmented um, component. And it creates conversation. And I think the fundament, for me, the fundamental issue is to create the great good places, very simple, uh, that simply encourage conversation in the raising of the quality and the character of the, of the interaction between people. So I'd like your comment on that. And that comes from someone who is both saddled with the mechanics of building a city, but also cares a great deal about the interaction that shapes a city. Um. You're on to something that's really um, wonderful about placemaking practices. 
that space is usually being animated by artists. They're reading, they're doing them. I mean, that space became alive. Artists came in as placemakers to do something. And usually when that happened, in any kind of, like the dancers in the world, or you know, theater productions that are happening outside of the 99 seat street lot on a, on a, on in a park, those become sort of ways in which you start to learn how to behave or you get invited to you know, feel comfortable in this open space. I, I go there as a funder, public funder. I just get to play. I'm always looking like, um, okay, for example, we just did this last weekend. Um, there was a Cicla Villa, which is sort of like a, a festival where all the, they closed down a lot of streets in the city. And they closed down a lot of streets in the city. You can get to ride your bike around. So we did all, we, 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 we supported a dozen little pop-up art, art experiences. So that, that kind of animated the street more than just, hey Joe, how you doing today? But oh, let's stop and do this. So I think that's really where arts become really, really an important part of sort of building that sense Hello, sir. Uh, I would like to ask if in, uh, in your mind, if a place can be made successfully without um, a, a simultaneous rise in economic indicators that are traditionally looked at to define uh, a successfully um, growing economy. That's a good question, sir. It's so funny, you know, oh buddy, <laughs> uh, you know, let me try to figure out how to answer that. I'm not opposed to economic growth. Um, and coupled with economic development is human development, and that's what I privilege. Um, and so I wanna make sure that the people in, in a place feel that they're validated. And I gotta believe that once you feel validated, money follows. I mean, you're going to be asking for jobs. You're going to be asking for a living wage. You know, I mean, when I think about, it's so funny, I, you know, I think, I don't know, I was reading something and maybe it was about, I don't want to damn them completely, art, art place, but there's like, I have this vexed feeling like I want to love them, but I don't know how because I don't get them. Uh, and so when they were talking about vitality and stuff like that, I'm thinking like, you know what? If you go to the Mexican, the food city, the Mexican supermarket on the, on the west side of my town at six o'clock in the morning to six o'clock and eight a.m., it is the most vital part. Day workers are there, people are dropping off their babies, they're buying tamales for the day, whatever they're doing, and then it's dead. And then again at six o'clock at night, to eight, it's another hub. So, you know, I'm thinking about, so that sort of, um, I, I, I guess I tell that story because I think there's a, the, the images that are sort of foregrounded through art place don't, don't, sh don't tell that story of that vitality. And so um, placemaking then to me sort of becomes a little, when I want to sh un unhinge it from location, I want to look at hives, where there are hives in that city, and how that makes a place. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm at with that. I just want to say that there's a great study by Mark Stern, Susan Seifert of Philadelphia. So uh, gentrification happens when there's generalized pressure on land values. and other outside people who want to come in. <laughs> and that, that is a concern, even in you know neighborhoods that start with equity. But what they found in Philadelphia says nobody really wants to move to Philadelphia. That neighborhoods which had, had artists or cultural facilities were more diverse, safer, and that there wasn't any, uh, there wasn't any generalized rise. I mean, they were, they were better places to live, but there wasn't any of this, you know, the thing that happened in Soho, which has become so famous and everybody thinks 
that happens everywhere, that if you put a few artists in there, then suddenly those, that doesn't happen in most places. Let me just sort of, um, and then I'll go to you, Greg. Gregory. Um, I've been thinking about this the other day, about sort of like, um, we have, we ha I have an art town grant, and I'm working uh, with the, uh, the warehouse district with a lot of artists. I'm lucky in the sense that the artists were mobilized um, in which they own three pieces of property. Three or four, Grace? Four. four. Anyway, they own a number of, they own, and that's good. So that in somehow their identity and their, their the, that cultural production can still happen there. But it, it, it was really interesting because um, I was talking also with a colleague, Deborah Cullen, who runs Intersection for the Arts in San Francisco, and they moved into a big development complex in, at Fifth and Mission, and people are like this about it, um, and it's working with a big time developer. But I think what's happening is sort of a reimagining of a workforce that was always in buildings that were always already workforce buildings. Either there were warehouses, and now they're no longer warehouses. There might be for creative entrepreneur types. So th that displacement is not so much of, of moving people out of their homes. It's a displacement as different kind of workforces come into being. However, it's, it's not to say that gentrification happens and I mean, it's really, really hard to sometimes stop the force of speculation culture. It dominates America, it's capitalism. And so it always will figure out how to get what it wants. And so I'm gonna go back to, um, when, I, when I bring all my grantees together um, and about once a year from the Place Initiative, and I ask them the question, well, you know, I have to evaluate you. How do you want to be evaluated? You know, oh, I don't have time. I don't have time. There's no money. But then, and then. Anyway, long story. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, they, they say, so, but how are you clocking it? How do you know you're having success? And I said, ultimately, they, they, they think about agency. They think about the communities they're working in and the students or whoever they are. And do they feel like, they began this project and now over here, they feel like there's more agency. So it goes back to what Michael was saying. If a, a group of working poor people feel at the end of a creative placemaking project that they can demand fresh fruit, fruit in their supermarket and a supermarket, they have agency and they will move forward and help to realize maybe that market. I'm not sure, but that's sort of, hypothetical about, you know, understanding what could happen. Gregory. I think that's a really nice segue into this question that I have that's about recognizing you have uh, agency and leadership. I think one of the things that was really interesting about the project that you spoke of early on, the Bill Mackey project about urban, uh, the urban planning for Tucson was in addition to asking the community what they wanted in their community, he had since the early 1900s, he had every master plan that had developed for Tucson in that room on the walls that could be studied. So you got to see the, the evolution and history of how those notions of leadership and governance and who is consulted had played out in the community those people lived in. It was a great forum for that. Now the, uh, that leads to this question that I wanna ask you specifically. Because we've been in a cultural time when uh, all the sort of agencies like yours, the Tucson Female Arts Council, and um, in many cities are tightening their belts, they're cut down to a third, a quarter, a tenth of the budget they need to live on. They are not in a sight of, of, of agency on their own to do the work that you are managing to do in a place that doesn't have a lot of resource. And you know, and I see it up here. We are doing interesting things up here. It's coming out of the university. It's coming out of uh, different types of cultural institutions and, and still out of some over agencies, but not at the same level. You're making a commitment to go after a Kresge grant, to go after major funding, to support the artist creators in your community. I wanna know how you are doing, making that commitment, how you're aligning your support in your community 
in part and how your history as someone who's been in and out of those inside roles, you know, you're a consultant, then you're a, how have you pulled that off and what do you have to say to the people in the room, to the students in the room about stepping up to leadership in a time like today? I think about my mom. <laughs> I mean, that's the simple answer. She's the most willful person I know. She taught me how to be willful. She taught me how to continue to proceed um, and, and how to ask and to be smart and, and to really do be thoughtful and not to be a blowhard and try to listen to, to uh, a constituency you serve. The Place Initiative came out of a, a, a cultural plan that we did, mm, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years ago. Um, and we decided then among our, our, uh, the stakeholder community, which was about you know, 500 different people from all over the, the city, to create this initiative to celebrate sort of what we felt was the distinctiveness and identity of, 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 of our community. And in some ways, uh, the PLACE initiative, which kind of basically s supports uh, civic engagement work, came out of a strong community arts move that's always been around in, 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 in Tucson. And, and, but, you know, as my, I mean, like I said, oh God, you know, my, I've lost 45% of my public funding in the last, since the recession has hit. It's been devastating. I've been profoundly lucky um, to kind of form these partnerships with uh, the Kresge Foundation, the Open Society Foundation, Nathan Cummings Foundation came forward and helped me. I saw in the program that there's going to be like a pitch section. Let me tell you my pitch story. It's never an elevator. It's an escalator. I'm at a conference in Seattle and the Americans for the Arts Conference five, six years ago. And it was on the, the we were going up to the ballroom on the fourth floor. Um, you know, all these people are just getting on the escalator. I get on the escalator. I happen to be right next to this, this African-American woman. I introduce myself to her, Roberto Bedoya from Tucson. Oh, I'm Regina Smith, I'm from uh, Michigan. And I said, well, what do you do? Oh, I work at the Kresge Foundation. I said, oh, interesting. I run the Arts Council in Tucson. She goes, oh, I've been studying Kresge. I've been studying Tucson. I said, really, what for? Well, you know, you, you have one of the highest percentage of poverty in the US. I said, oh, yeah, I know that. So anyway, we were just sort of like going this, we're going like this, up, up, four flights of escalators, and I told her what I had, and she said, that sounds very good. Let's continue the conversation. So I pitched it to her, but not you know, in an elevator where you have 30 seconds. You actually need longer if you have a complex subject, and you need to really know how to tell your story and have a dialogue. Um, but I think I could tell you where I'm, I'm trying to read the pulse on, on like every private foundation, uh, you know, that's fading. My relationship is not over, but it's fading. And more and more private foundations are want to look at cross-sector work. Uh, so, placemaking is perfect. Placemaking means that now when I look at placemaking, I'm talking, I talk to the mayor, I talk to housing, and I say, I want you to put me into your, your, your agenda. Find a place for place in your place, your agenda. So that's kind of where that sort of tempo is. Anything else or maybe well, we're- We have time for maybe one or two more. Maybe some of the students in the room might have some questions for Roberto. Any questions? Um, is it possible or, or I guess maybe what does it look like um, to have, uh, um, to work on having, um, talking about you know, being creative and going into different types of communities and stuff uh, without active engagement from uh, people of color and the other people that, uh, if 
in those communities? I mean, I guess it sounds like kind of a basic, silly question, but I see it all the time. <laughs> Say it again. I'm, I'm so, I mean, um, is it possible, or what does it look like to have to try to have uh, to go into different communities uh, to try to be creative, work in there, uh, try to uh, offer agency without the without the creative ideas of people of color or women? Depends which neighborhood you're working in. I mean, obviously. I read that poem at the very beginning because I'm very, just, you know, I, I, I think of the desert a lot. I love the desert. And I think of who's been the, who, you know, the first peoples of this, this part of the world. So it's just, you begin every, every relationship with humility. You have to. You have to find out who are the local knowledges and who are the gatekeepers. I can go to a Pasquayaki moment, and it could be really interesting. You know, you talk to A, well, A is not authorized to tell that story. B is, and C says, no, D is. And you know, you could sit in that circle for a long time, and before you find out really what you need to know. When I was telling you that story about the folk life school, I mean, I think there is a, oh man, this is so complicated because I think, you know, that folk life score, obviously, you know, um, the indigenous community that are in urban Tucson have been so colonized so many times and been the subject of research so much, they're just, they're, 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 they're defense me the defense me the mechanism is just silence. You know, um, and so I get it. When I work with my Latino community, it's it's really interesting. Uh, first of all, uh, I don't know how to solve all the all the problems. Um, I listen. I, I I here's a, a project that we did that was actually really. I guess the question is, sometimes now I'm speaking as a, a person of color um, in this field of practice. You know, I always say, I need more of you. Don't bitch to me, um, you know, Jose or Maria. I want you to be the damn leader. You come to that table. Get up and speak to mayor and council. Become the president of the Neighborhood Association. Give me grief, because you don't like that public art. I'd rather have you do that than call me up once a year and say, you're not serving me. You know, man, I, you know, I, I, I have to sort of assert agency. And, and um, but you know, it's the trauma of racism. Uh, you know, my grandpa never had his papers. This is a funny story, I don't know why I'm telling you this one. But um, you know, and he probably was amnesty, he was probably amnesty many times over because he came over uh, the beginning of the 1900s. And you know, it was so weird. And then I just was thinking like, you know, I have an odd history. I have an odd history um, in which I'm sort of skirted in and out of the academy. But you know, I never had a, 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 a college degree. And until I turned 50, I decided I better get one. Um, I had been a Getty Scholar, I'd been a Rockefeller Fellow, but without a BA. I just had just talked my shit and got far and all that stuff. And um, I really, then I had to take it, I had to, I had to pause and say, well, what's this? And that, you know, why am I afraid of papers? I'm an undocumented egghead, I told myself, and I better get my papers in order if I'm going to, I'm going to have agency. So the trauma of racism out west and of Mexican Americans, I see that a lot. I see, now, now I'm speaking from the heart. Because I see those Latino kids being streamlined to prison, just like that. You know, and you know, and if the art is all about sort of self-affirmation art, it's I'm totally cool with it. But when your book is banned from school, from you know, from your school, shit. I mean, you know, it's like what is going on here? Excuse my language. But anyway, it's sort of like. You know, that, that sort of, that's in which you really need to employ arts to be as liberating, a liberate, a emancipation and liberating tool, and it can. Thank you.
you so much. I, we're out of time for questions, but you can, I'm sure you can catch each other in the lobby. And uh, we'll take a, a, a five minute break and, and return for a workshop session with Laura Zabel of Springboard for the Arts. Thank you so much. Thank you.